in studying God's Word throughout this past year. Now please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of text which we read just a moment ago over in Exodus chapter 3. The message today is the names of God part 6. The names of God are inexhaustible. We're not going to be able to look at every name or every passage where the name of God is mentioned. But I hope that what we have been doing over the first five sessions where we're looking at the names of God and we saw eight revealed to us here in this particular text that we've read. As we've looked at the names of God, we have seen the character of God revealed. We've also discovered that all of these names are names that apply to our Lord Jesus Christ as we look at the parallel passages in the New Testament. So as we are talking about the names of God, what we are learning about is the character and person of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. It's a magnificent and, as I said, inexhaustible subject, something we will be learning about all through eternity. But the more we learn of him now through his names, the greater will be our capacity for serving him and obeying him as he has called us to do. The study of the names of God is not merely a theological exercise in knowing Hebrew and Greek words. The study of the names of God is what helps us to better understand the one whom we worship and thus to give him greater praise, adoration, and magnification of who he is and what he has done. You recall that as we looked before all those many holiday services which interrupted our study, as we looked at the names of God, we were looking at the name Jehovah and we were looking at how that related to the name of Christ or the name of Jesus, which refers to all that Jesus is, both as revealed by the prophets of the Old Testament and as he is now and as he ever will be, the one who was, who is, and who is to come, the Almighty, as he is portrayed in the book of Revelation. We see that all of the scriptures point to Christ, and thus all the names of God point to our Lord Jesus Christ as well. It is the name of Jesus, who he really is as the sovereign God, that gives us the willingness to suffer. This morning we prayed for the persecuted church and how indolent we are as we seldom think of our brothers and sisters. And yet the Apostle Paul explains to the Corinthians that when one member of the body suffers, the entire body suffers. And when one member rejoices, the entire body rejoices. But what we've tried to do is numb ourselves to the rest of the body of Christ around the world. We are very lethargic, very self-centered, and we put the mind-doping drugs of the world into our minds so that we don't have to think about those other people out there. But understanding the name of Jesus enables us to be able to suffer, and the scripture says so. As the Lord is speaking to Ananias, who has been told to go to Paul, Ananias answers, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Very important. He understood if you manifest the name of Christ, it may cost something. But the Lord tells him something else about his name. Listen to what Jesus says about Paul. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And then the name is mentioned again in the next verse. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. When we understand who God is, who our Lord Jesus Christ is as God, when we understand all that is 
in that box which we call the names of God, we're willing to suffer. We're willing to make some sacrifice. How little sacrifice we make for Christ. We show up for one hour, perhaps an hour and a half if I preach too long, on Sunday mornings, and we think we have tipped our hat to God. We've done everything for him that we need to do this week, and so we can get on with all our other busynesses of whatever it is that we happen to be doing. The church today has lost the concept of sacrificing something for Christ. If there's anything that gets in the way of our plans, you know, well, God has got to go first. If we're called upon to do something for the Lord, but it doesn't fit with what is on our agenda, that call has got to go. If there's an opportunity to minister and serve, but we're too busy, or it's a long way, or it costs gas, or whatever excuses we have, you know what gets cut out? It's God who gets cut out. Doesn't matter what the rest of the body of Christ might need. Doesn't matter what the rest of the body of Christ would be blessed by. Dear people, how great, great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we're not willing even to be inconvenienced. The name of Jesus expresses the great truth that only he can give us eternal salvation and eternal life. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That expresses who Jesus is as the Savior, as the one who gives eternal life. That believing you might have life through his name. Jesus the name means Jehovah is salvation. Yehoshua, Joshua in the Old Testament. Jehovah is salvation. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of Jesus declares his healing power. In Acts 4, be it known unto you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Our Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah Rophe, Jehovah the healer, Jehovah the physician, one of the names of God we've not yet looked at in the Old Testament. It points to Jesus. Every name of God points to Jesus Christ. He is the one to whom someday you will give an account as to whether or not you really knew him. He has revealed himself to you through his names. He expects you to know his names. Are you ever embarrassed when you come up to someone? You know you've met them, but you can't remember their name. I've had that happen to me many times. I'm meeting people all the time. And I'm starting to get those senior moments where I don't remember names anymore. But not to know the names of Christ? Well, that should be our central focus in life as we study Scripture, is to know Him whom to know is life eternal. To understand the intricacies of his name, the things that he has promised in his names, the things that he has done as revealed in his names, the things which he has provided as a blessing for you, as expounded by his names. Truly, the name of Christ and how it changes our lives, as Paul tells us, in 2 Timothy 2.19, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Do you name the name of Christ? Is it his name that's on your lips and then people watch your life? 
Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You've heard people say, well, he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. Dear people, let it not be said of us. If you name the name of Christ, show it by the way in which you live that the Spirit of God has transformed your life and is molding and shaping you into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw a little bit about the name Elohim last week. That was the name translated God in our text, occurring 2,700 times, and I gave you the wrong multiplication of that. Brother Platt pointed that out. I said three times, three times, three times a thousand. It's three times, three times, three times a hundred. I typed one too many zeros in my notes there last week, or two weeks ago, three weeks. That's occurring in Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. God, the one who is the creator. God, who is the one who is powerful. God, who made heaven and earth and all that in them is. Elohim, a plural form referring to the one true triune God. The first hint of the Trinity occurs in the very first verse of the Old Testament. As further enhanced, we saw when God said, let us make man in our plural image Singular. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So God, that's Elohim, plural, created man in his singular own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We find the plurals and the singulars mixed together because there is one God who exists in three persons. We saw the plural form Elohim is used with singular pronouns, for example, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is the quote that every Orthodox Jew quotes first thing in the morning. He quotes the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then the second thing he says, and I thank thee, O God, that thou hast not made me a woman. But the first thing he quotes is the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's Jehovah, our God, Elohim, that's a plural form. Jehovah is singular, is one one Lord. That's an incredible statement of doctrinal truth compounded in that one verse. The word one that is used here is the word echad. It's a composite unity. Like an orange, there are different words for one in Hebrew. And here it is echad. It is not yachid. Yachid is a singular form like you would think of an apple. One apple. But if you're referring to a composite unity, like an orange, you refer to it as echad, and that is the word that is used here, where God declares that at the forming of the marriage bond, he uses this word also through the intimacy that belongs only in marriage. The two shall be one flesh, echad. That's the composite unity, divisible only by death. They're still two distinct individual people, but in the eyes of God, they are one. And that can be broken only by death. That's the same word that is used of God. So you see the Father not as part of God, but as God, fully God. You see the Son as God, not as part of God, but as fully God. You see the Holy Spirit as God, fully God, not as part of God. And yet they are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, of course, I believe that by faith. But it is important to demonstrate to doubters the foolishness of their arguments so that we can remove the blockades that they are throwing up when we speak to them and get into the real discussion about who Jesus is. Same thing with the evolution issue. We believe it by faith that God created everything out of nothing. But if you're speaking to someone in the world today, they will throw up foolish arguments about evolution, knowing a little bit to dismiss their arguments so you can get to the real issue of who Jesus is and what he did. You should know a few things. The same is true here. I think I may have mentioned this to you in past messages some time ago. But many years ago, I spoke to a, a group of Jewish women up in Wayne, New Jersey, the Hadassah Organization. 
It's a uh, Jewish women's group that raises funds for Israel and builds hospitals and does things like that. Some hospitals in this country and also in Jerusalem are named Hadassah. And that, of course, is the name for Esther, Esther, her original Hebrew name. The ladies had asked me to speak on archaeology and prophecy. A very strange request came to me by phone from a lady I'd never met. And, uh, but she was sort of running the Hadassah group. Somehow she had heard that I had been studying in Israel and that uh, I had had the privilege of working on some of the archaeological things there. And so uh, she called me up in desperation, I suppose, for a speaker and uh, asked me to come and speak. We met at the public library. And um, so I told her in advance, I said, now you realize I'm a Christian. She said, oh, yes. Obviously, I was a pastor of a church. And uh, she says, uh, and I said, well, you realize that uh, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. She said, yes. I said, okay. And you realize that I'll be presenting this information and the Old Testament prophecies from a Christian viewpoint. Oh, yes, of course. I said, well, okay. Lord, you open the door. Here we go. I went and spoke that evening and um, pointed out that all of the scripture ultimately points to the Messiah and all of it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's a very quick summary of what my presentation was that evening. I talked about different archaeological digs and certain things that have been found in Jerusalem while I was there and a privilege I'd had of seeing some of this stuff. But I pointed to Christ and as we got almost to the end of it, I could see she was getting a little bit agitated because she began to realize what I was doing was witnessing to her Jewish group. And so um, they closed down and afterwards they had a little time of refreshments. And we all uh, had the privilege of sitting around tables and talking and people would come over and talk to me. i had been the speaker and the tables were covered with paper tablecloths. And this lady's husband was a Jewish doctor. And he came over to me and he said, um, you believe that Jesus is God, yes. You believe that the Father is God, yes. You believe that the Holy Spirit is God, yes. Ah, he said, you believe in three gods and we believe in one. I said, no, no, you've got it all wrong. I believe in one God, only one God. And that the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. There's one God. He scratched his head. He said, well, can you explain that to me? I said, okay. And I had a pencil and I wrote on the tablecloth. He was sitting across from me. And I wrote one, one, and one. I said, what you think I believe, which I don't, is this. One plus one plus one equals three except I guess I wrote it the other direction because he was looking at me across the table. And I sa he said, yes, that's what I think you th believe. I said, you're wrong. Let me show you again. One, one, and one. Write them down again. Is each one of these a distinct and separate integer? Yes. And they are complete in and of themselves? Yes. And they're not the same as the other one. They are really separate from each other as we can see them laid out on the tablecloth. Yes. I said, well, then the problem is you don't understand the relationship between them. And I put a times sign between each of those ones equals one. I said, we don't understand fully the relationship that exists in the Godhead, but the scripture clearly reveals to us that there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. They are distinct one from another, but they are co-equal. They are distinct one from another, but not to be confused with one another as in modalism. They're distinct one from another, but their relationship surmises to the very, very clearly stated conclusion in Scripture that there is one God. And I took him over to Deuteronomy 6.4. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, is Echad, is one. I said, that's composite unity, isn't it? That's not singularity unity. I went and talked with some other folks. He sat there for the longest time looking at that tablecloth and scratching his chin. Dear people, we need to have some things that we can say to people to get over the arguments that remove what they think is the obstacle to trusting Christ 
as their Messiah, as their Lord, as their Savior. The name Elohim reveals the omnipotent power of God who can create something out of nothing without using up part of himself. This name of God is also abbreviated in Hebrew Bible as El and is often used in the compound names of God. El Elyon, God the highest one, first used when God appears to Abraham. El Shaddai and so on, we'll talk about those names later on. Another form of Elohim is the word Eloah. That's the name of the Creator God in the context of worship. That is a name that is used of God when it is speaking of God as the living God and the one who gives life in contrast to false gods and idols. It's used many times in the scripture, but we find its first occurrence in Deuteronomy 32.15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God. That's the name Eloah. Then he forsook Eloah, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. It's the name Eloah that is used here, the creator God who is the one who gives life in contrast to the idols and the pagan false gods and to the devils who only take life. Another form of Elohim is the name El Elohe Yisrael, which means God, the God of Israel. When the name is compounded as it is in these passages, using both the singular form El and the plural form Elohim, the emphasis is on his awesome power. You'll discover many of the names of God point to his power, different aspects of his power. So an appropriate translation would be similar to that name that we saw three or four weeks ago, El Gibor, the mighty God. That's the one in Isaiah 9, 6. The prophesied Messiah would be the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We've just heard it in Handel's Messiah over the, the Christmas holidays. God, the mighty one. God, the mighty God of Israel, El Elohe Yisrael. That's the name that joins the covenant promises of God with God's irresistible power to fulfill his covenant promises. We see an illustration of that name when Jacob returns to the land and is met by Esau coming to meet him with 400 armed men. After wrestling all night with the angel of the Lord and being permanently crippled, and then sending his presence to Esau, Jacob builds an altar to the Lord with that name. He recognized that it was the power of God who had made the covenant with him that it actually delivered him from the power and the hatred of his brother Esau. Genesis 33, so Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of that place is called Sukkot, which is the name, of course, of a modern feast in Israel, a feast given by God, the tabernacles, the feast of tabernacles or the feast of booths. It's the feast of Sukkot. And Jacob, but for different reasons, and Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money. Verse 20. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Yisrael. It's interesting as we look at that name that Jacob gave to that altar in honor of the God who had delivered him and the God who was keeping covenant with him in spite of his waywardness and his wanderings, which we discussed when we went through the book of Genesis. But it's interesting to notice Jacob had to purchase a place here to camp out, even though God had promised to give this land to him. 
spent a hundred pieces of silver for it. As we saw in our study of Jacob during the book of Genesis, he constantly wavered between faith and doing things on his own. That name El is a beautiful name. It's part of over 80 personal names and place names in the Bible. Parents gave their children names that would identify them with this one who was the powerful creator as a testimony to all those who were around them. They also named their children with this name as a divine blessing and prayed that their children would provide blessing for others. We see it in the names such as the name Elijah, Eliah, my God is Jehovah. Eliezer, God is my helper. Elhanan, God is gracious. Eliav, God is my father. Elimelech, my God is king. Eli Melech. Elisha, God of my supplication or God of my petitions and prayers. Sometimes the name of God, the name El, is found at the end of names in scripture. Nathaniel, gift of God. Samuel, God has heard. Mahalaliel, praise to God. Dear friends, how important it is that we pass a testimony on down to our children through names. Help them to understand the meaning of their names so that they might be a blessing through their names to others. It's interesting to notice that we find the name El compounded into names given to children early in the Bible. But it's interesting that the name Jehovah is not compounded into names given to children until the Mosaic era. God told Moses at the burning bush that the name Jehovah, the name Yah, or Yahweh, was specifically the name by which he would be known as the covenant God of Israel. It was not until the times of Samuel, which is, as you know, the end of the period of the judges, that the name Jehovah became commonly compounded into the names given to children. It is also interesting to notice that this was the time of great apostasy, even though they were naming their children with this great covenant name of God. It was a time of great apostasy when, as the last verse of Judges tells us, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. How much that reminds us of our own day and age. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. There is no absolute standard. There is no divine authority. The name of Jesus has been removed except as a curse word. God is forbidden in the public schools. His word is forbidden in the public schools. Prayer to him is forbidden in the public schools. Is it any wonder that he has deserted the public schools? The name of God. Having an external show of worshiping the true God does not mean that your heart is right. You can do everything right on the outside, but that doesn't mean that your heart is right with God. The next name we want to look at that belongs to God is the name Yahweh Sabaoth, Jehovah Sabaoth in English. That's the name that means the Lord of Hosts. That's the way it's translated 235 times in the Old Testament. The Lord of hosts, literally, the Lord of armies. That's the name that God presents himself as a warrior God and the Lord of the armies of heaven. It is not Jehovah Sabbath, as a totally different Hebrew word, Jehovah Sabaoth not Jehovah's Sabbath. The name is used of God 235 times because God clearly wants us to know that he is in charge of the universe. There are no armies that can contend with him. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn this the difficult way in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar had set himself up proudly. He knew that he was the head of gold in the image of Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. And so he was going to prove it. And he got proud about it. And so he said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built? And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, The kingdom is departed from thee. 
And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Don't complain about elections, folks. God is the God who puts the men in authority to accomplish his purposes. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heavens till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now listen to verses 34 and 35. Nebuchadnezzar was a man who learned his lesson. Nebuchadnezzar was a proud man whom God broke and humbled his heart. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? I don't know, but I think we may someday see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Can't prove it. But certainly he gained an understanding of who the true and living God is. The one who is over all the armies of heaven. The Lord of Sabaoth. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies. That's clearly a presentation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 19.11 I saw heaven opened, and I behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now listen to verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Jesus Christ is Lord of Sabaoth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of hosts. Jesus Christ is the Lord of armies. That should be a warning to us, folks. The very first time that that name is found in Scripture is in the narrative of the conception of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a man, Ramathiam Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice, now listen, unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And right after it tells us, the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, the very next sentence says, And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. That's a warning in that passage, folks. That's a warning in that passage. Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were abusing their position before the one whose eyes in the book of Revelation are described as a flame of fire, whose feet are described as fine brass, those three were abusing their position. Eli, for failing to restrain his sons. Hophni and Phinehas, for committing adultery in the tabernacle and stealing from the offerings brought by God's people. That's the context of the first time the name the Lord of hosts appears in the Bible. And all three were killed. Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, who carried the ark into battle thinking it was a magic talisman. Eli when he heard the news that the ark had been captured and fell backwards and broke his neck. 
We find the name again when Hannah vows to give Samuel to the Lord as a Nazarite. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and forget not thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. That is the name that David calls God when he does battle with Goliath the Philistine. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Dear friends, that's a powerful name. That's the name by which David slew Goliath the Philistine. Because he had defied the Lord of hosts, Goliath had to die. Because he had defied the armies of the Lord of hosts, Goliath had to die. The Lord of hosts is the God of Israel. The character of God is given for the reason of David's military success by that name. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. That's the name by which God is called as the one dwelling between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baalai Judah to bring up from thence the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. That is the name that assures that the Davidic covenant will be established forever. Let it even be established that thy name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel, and let the house of David thy servant be established before thee. Let me give you just one other illustration of it. Our time is gone. That is the name by which God was called in the beautiful Psalms of Ascent. The people every year as they would travel to Jerusalem for the three feasts required by God for every male aged 20 and over to attend, as they ascended up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is set in the mountains, as they would go up they would sing these psalms, one of which is Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. We know who that is. That is Jesus Christ. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Here it is. The Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth. The Lord of armies. The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Dear friends, Psalm 24 is pointing to Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the king of glory. If you listen to Handel's Messiah, and I hope you did over Christmas time, you know there's this magnificent chorus with the antiphonal responses throughout. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up the everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. Oh, dearly beloved, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in all the scriptures. The God whom we worship. But the God also to whom we must give account. The one who has eyes is a flame of fire. The one who has feet like brass. And when we come before him with our miserable, feeble excuses about why we didn't commit it all to him, he is the one to whom we give an account 
the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, yet we thank you for your revealing of your Son, Jesus Christ, in all the scriptures. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is the one before whom we humbly bow. With adoration, with worship, with praise, and with humility, for we are a sinful people. And we come only into your presence by your grace. By your grace. Help us to understand how far down you had to reach to scrape slime like we are off the bottom. The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen.